everybody welcome back to my channel and if you are new to my channel hello my name is Gabby and welcome if you've never been here before you don't know what I do on my channel here on my little YouTube channel I cover true crime cases and all of the true crime cases that I cover are more on the vintage side. Pretty much every case is 20 years or older. Now we are in the month of November and for November I have a theme and this month's theme is No Trace November. So every single case that I cover this month is going to be a case with no trace, a disappearance case. Before we get into the case that I have for you all today, I do have to say that today's video is sponsored and it is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community that has thousands upon thousands of classes that allow your creativity to flourish. It's a place where you can interact with fellow creatives where you are able to enhance current skills and develop new ones. Skillshare is a membership with meaning. You can dive into such productivity classes as animation, graphic design, illustration, music, photography, or even help build your business with such classes as business analytics and marketing. Creative challenges and productivity classes are a great way to structure your free time and set some achievable and rewarding goals for yourself. So whether you're trying to subside current boredom, manage some stress, focus on some health care through learning, or just join a community of people with similar interests, Skillshare is a place for you. For basically a large portion of quarantine, I had been taking a lot of classes on Skillshare, and the class that I am currently taking is taught by Emily Zotska, and it is called iPhone Photography, How to Shoot and Edit Conceptual Photos on Your Phone. If you absolutely love photography and you don't have a fancy camera or you don't have really expensive editing software, I definitely recommend taking this class. There are 34 lessons. She really knows what she's talking about. She's been commissioned by Apple and her photography has been on display all around the world. This is just one class though that I recommend from Skillshare. If you want to check out Skillshare yourself, the first thousand people that sign up for Skillshare by clicking the link in the description of this video will get a free trial for their service. You get to dive into as many classes as you want and then after that it is only $10 a month. Thank you Skillshare for sponsoring another one of my videos and with all that being said, let's get right into the case. Today we're going to be discussing the disappearance of little Benita Karen Sanders. This is a case that I recently came across probably about a week and a half ago. We are going to go over all of the research that I found online and then we are going to hear what Benita's biological sister has to say about what she remembers from the day that Benita Karen went missing. Benita Karen Sanders was born on September 17th of the year 1984 to parents Abdul Salam and Benita Sanders. Her mother was also named Benita Sanders. Benita's parents were never legally married and were together for eight years before separating. Benita's mother had four children, two of which were Abdul's. Now, since Benita Karen Sanders and her mother have the same exact first and last name, I'm going to be referring to baby Benita as Benita Karen, including her middle name, and then I'm going to be referring to her mother as Benita Sanders. This story takes place only three days before Benita Karen's second birthday. Bonita Sanders was living in the Virginia Court Apartments in the 900 block of Baltic Avenue in Atlantic City, New Jersey. According to Bonita Sanders, on September 14, 1986, at around 6 p.m., Bonita Karen was strapped into her stroller on the front porch, eating an orange popsicle, while the other three children were playing outside. Bonita Sanders claimed that when she looked outside around 7 p.m., Bonita Karen was gone from her stroller and nowhere to be found. She said that she immediately started searching Baltic Avenue and the surrounding streets but could not locate her baby anywhere. And at 8.30 p.m. that night, she reported Bonita Karen missing. Bonita Karen's father was immediately ruled out as a suspect due to the fact that he was imprisoned at the time for robbery charges. 
Before this imprisonment, though, he was trying to gain custody of his daughter. So they ruled out her father, Abdul Salam, and they started looking at her mother, Bonita Sanders. Now, when it comes to Bonita Sanders, there were a lot of things in the past, and there would be a lot of things in the future that make her look very suspicious. According to the Charlie Project, Bonita allegedly abandoned Bonita Karen at birth, and also attempted to abandon another newborn after Bonita Karen disappeared. Bonita reportedly walked out of an Atlantic City hospital in 1984 and left Bonita Karen at the facility. She was not charged in that case, but Bonita did face charges when she gave birth to a son in October of 1986, one month after Bonita Karen was last seen. Bonita checked into Atlantic City Medical Center under the alias Laura Smith to deliver and was discharged on October 7, 1986. Bonita apparently then left with her newborn son and took a cab to an Atlantic City bus terminal. She boarded a bus to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and left the baby lying face down in a terminal restroom in Atlantic City where he was rescued shortly thereafter. Bonita was sentenced to nine months in jail for endangering the welfare of a child in January 1987, and her three other children were placed in foster homes. She was paroled after five months, but served another 15 months when she was arrested for shoplifting baby clothes while on parole. The father of Benita's newborn son told authorities that she lied to him and said she had an abortion when she was pregnant with the child. He did not know she had carried the baby to term and given birth until he was contacted by law enforcement. Benita had three more sons after the one she abandoned in 1986. I know from that insert, it is a lot to take in and it does make you sick to your stomach. Reading over this, entire story and going over all of the details and collecting everything for my video, it it put a knot in my stomach because the details surrounding it are heartbreaking. When it comes to the search of Bonita Karen, it doesn't seem like Bonita Sanders, her mother, really wanted to help authorities locate her missing baby. The prosecutor in Bonita's case said that Bonita Sanders told them many lies during questioning and gave them many false leads. Also, through the years, you would think that a grieving mother would call authorities to check up on the case and see where it is, see if there's new leads, see what's going on in the case, but Benita Sanders never did. Benita Karen's father, Abdul Salam, made mistakes in life, but he did care deeply for his children and come to find out, before Benita Karen went missing, Abdul stated that New Jersey Division of Health and Family Services, or DYFS, was supposed to check on Benita Karen's well-being. When they made their first visit, no one seemed to be home at the Sanders residence. And when they made their second visit, little Benita was already missing. Abdul Salam, the father of Benita Karen, did not believe that little Benita Karen was simply just taken off of the front porch, and he believed that Benita Sanders had something to do with it. So he asked that the backyard of the apartment be searched for human remains. Authorities did end up bringing in cadaver dogs to sniff around the property, and they came across no evidence to indicate that a human body was buried on the property. From there on, the case basically went cold, but there would be a small spark in the case in 2009. In early 2009, from my research, Benita Sanders' best friend went to authorities and told them that Benita had buried her daughter in a wooded area in Pleasantville, New Jersey. The search went down on February 23rd of 2009, but by February 27th, they called off the search after finding no evidence of a child being buried in this location. A forensic anthropologist stated that just because they did not find Benita Karen's remains there when they searched, it doesn't mean her remains were never there at some point. 
They did continue to ask the public for information regarding the case, though, and were on the search for Benita Sanders, so they could question her again about the strange disappearance. So for about three months, from February to May of 2009, they were on the search for Bonita Sanders. They didn't really know where she was, where she was hiding, where she could be living, and the person who would end up locating her would be none other than Abdul Salam. According to PressOfAtlanticCity.com, the focus turned to interviewing the little girl's mother. Housel, who is the Atlantic County prosecutor on this case, would not call her a suspect or say why she was wanted for questioning. But her other daughter with Salam, Tamika Sanders, who was four when her little sister disappeared, has insisted her mother was involved. She has never spoken publicly about what she knows. Whatever the case, the elder Bonita Sanders could not be found. That was until Salam went out on one of his frequent bike rides Tuesday night. It was sometime before 9 p.m. when Salam said he saw Sanders walking down the street. She didn't think I recognized her because she had this big white beach hat pulled over her head, he said. He grabbed her arm. Don't touch me, she said, according to Salam. Okay, I'm not going to put my hands on you. I just want to talk to you, he said. She said, I ain't got nothing to say to you and kept walking. Salam watched her walk down the street and into an apartment in Stanley Holmes Village. Then he called 911. I told the dispatcher, she was wanted for questioning in my daughter's murder, Salam said. He watched as police entered the house, but the woman's identification had another name, Salam said. He was called in to verify that it was Sanders. She had changed her clothes just that quick, he said, just that quick, but it wasn't quick enough. Salam said Sanders shook her head at him, trying to get him to deny it was her. It didn't work. I don't want her to get away, he said. I want it all resolved finally. Atlantic City Police confirmed Sanders was arrested on Rosemont Place in Stanley Holmes on outstanding warrants from other municipalities. As of Wednesday evening, she remained in Atlantic County Jail on just those warrants, with bails of $32 and $454, according to jail records. The prosecutor's office does not comment about who is questioned in ongoing cases. Housel said through his spokeswoman, Madeleine Vitali, he said only that the case is open and active. Abdul said that Benita Sanders running was pretty much what gave it away that she was guilty. And he said that his entire goal in this case and what he wants to be the final outcome is for them to just locate Benita Karen's remains and give her a proper burial. Even the prosecutor on this case released a statement to the public saying that they do not believe that Benita Karen is out there and that she is simply missing or that she was sold to somebody else or that she was abducted by somebody and possibly has lived out her life in a different area. They believe that Bonita Karen passed away, or her life was taken, the day that she supposedly went missing, and that it's just a matter of finding her remains. There are some law enforcement out there that have a theory that Bonita Karen, her life was not taken in a malicious way, and that she had accidentally choked on the popsicle stick that she had the day that she supposedly went missing, and that her mother disposed of her body somewhere, but there is no solid evidence to back up this theory. In the year 2010, more than 23 years after Benita Karen went missing, a service was held for the family to say goodbye to her, even though her body has never been located. This day was in full dedication to the little girl who never got to live out her life. The service was held at All Wars Memorial Building in Atlantic City, and everyone there shared stories about Benita Karen. Her older sister, Tamika Sanders, was only four at the time that her sister vanished, but remembers her sister greatly. They even let off orange balloons in honor of the little orange popsicle Benita was enjoying before she went missing. At the service, Tamika read out loud, The short time we shared was a blessing to me. I'm here today hoping you can finally be free. Just like so many other families out there, Benita Karens just want a final resolution. They just want to locate this little girl's remains and give her a proper burial. Their hope for her still being alive is completely gone. They have 
helped give themselves a little bit of peace, but they just want an end to it all. They just want the story to have a full conclusion. Now, when I was researching this case, I had quite a few questions, but I really had one main question. And the only person that would be able to answer that based on my research was Tamika Sanders, which was the four-year-old sister of Benita Karen, who is supposedly the only person that remembers much from that day. I did a little bit of digging online and I found the Facebook page dedicated to Benita Karen Sanders' case and I messaged the person who was running the page. And the person running the page just so happens to be her sister, Tamika Sanders. I messaged Tamika and she was so kind and so helpful and she is such a sweet woman and she has gone through so much when it comes to her sister's case and she just cares so much about it and she just wants to see it finally solved and I had talked to her we had texted a little bit and I asked her which was basically my main question what she remembers about that day and she was more than happy to answer my question instead of sending a text and going over everything that happened she asked me if she could send me a voice note and I said of course that would be totally fine and after she sent me over the voice note I listened to it and I had chills and I knew at that second that I did not want to sit in front of a camera and go over everything myself. I wanted you all to hear it in her own words from somebody who was there that day and somebody who was there after and it includes a lot of information that cannot be found online. Right now I'm going to let you listen to Tamika Sanders go over everything that she remembers from the day that her little sister went missing and what she remembers afterwards, even being a small child. Um, so that day, I remember like it was yesterday, me, my older sister Tamara, my younger sister Tashima, and Nita, um, was getting ready to go outside to play, and my mom had given us all popsicles. Me and Nita had orange, Tamara had purple, because that was her favorite color, and Shima had red. Normally, Nita would come play with us, but not all the time, because she was pretty much still a baby, but not really a baby. She was one. Um, that particular day, my mom was like, you know, she was going to stay there and eat her popsicle, you know, in the stroller. So it wasn't anything outside of the norm. So, you know, we just went on to play into this lot that was adjacent to the house that we had lived in. And that's what we did. My mom has been consistent about a few things, and it's always been about the same time we ate dinner, always about five. Anyway, needless to say, that particular day we were playing in the lot, my younger sister Tashima kicked the ball. We were playing with the ball and the ball rolled. And it rolled towards the street. Well, pretty much like the curb, but that particular part of the street didn't have cement because it was like a lot. So anyway, I went to go get the ball. And when I picked the ball up, I, you know, turned or mainly to look at my house, not because I felt like it just coincidentally. And I seen my aunt's boyfriend, Bruce, his cab, you know, he was getting out of the car, no big deal, that's Uncle Bruce, and I continued to play. So we played for a little bit more, and then my mom had called us and to eat. Well, um, once we had gotten to the house, you know, she says to us, like, where's Nita? And my reply was instantly, what are you asking us for? She was here with you. And she said to me, you know, your mouth, you always got something to fuck to say go wash your hands so that y'all can eat. And my mom, her twin sister Angela, my aunt Juanita, and her best friend Christine, they were all still standing there, um, you know, in the dining room kitchen area. And me and my two sisters went on to wash our hands and we came back and we sat down and we had spaghetti for dinner. Um, a little while later, like it was almost dark, my aunt's boyfriend Bruce came back and he took us to the police station and that's when my mom went and filed the report. When we left there, we came back home and then my mom said, you know, she was going to go to my dad's mom's house to let them know that Nita was missing. Um, I'm not sure if it was the very next day, but I know we ended up going back to the police station for them to interview us. And then that's when I met Teresa from the FBI. And, um... You know, we pretty much told them our version, our story or whatever. And then 
the next time that I seen her because I remember I had seen, you know, the only car I had seen was Bruce's blue car pull up to the house. That was it, nothing else. Um, and we had got back home from the police station. They asked, you know, what I had told them. And, you know, I told them exactly what I just said. So, I've always had an outspoken view on life as far as even being a kid. And that's why I look back, like, and I always say, it's my job to keep her story alive, not even knowing that just being boisterous then would make me be here into the position I am today. So, um, once I had said that, you know, what I had just told you is what I told him, you know, my mom and my aunt started going off or whatever and was like, oh no, you know, you gotta let them know that's not the color car. It wasn't Bruce's car, it was a different color blue, blah, 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 this, that, and the third. So of course, as a kid, you know, I did what I was told. So the next time I had spoken with Teresa, um, the color blue had changed. So knowing now, I know that she knew then, well, they all knew then at that moment, I was being coerced, but as a kid, it is what it is. So needless to say, Teresa continuously came back day by day to get me to drive me around looking for this car. And three weeks later, um, my whole life changed. Is when my mom gave birth to my brother Al in Philly under an assumed name. And that all came from the detective Teresa who was working on my sister's case, who realized that my mom had looked a little thinner and said whatever she said. And they went and found out that it was her who actually had, had the baby. And it was literally three weeks from the day that Nita was murdered. The case broke in 2009. Um, and they said they had received the tip and coming to find out the tip, I believe, was from my mom's twin sister, Angela, because they were up North Jersey when I had called the detectives when I had found out, um, that they were digging for. And he had told me, you know, he was one was interviewing a witness. And at that time, my best friend was locked up in Clinton Prison in New Jersey. And she also told me a few days later after seeing me on the news that my aunt was talking to some detectives from the city. So it all made sense. So my mom's friend, Christine, who was there with them that day in the kitchen, was in the county jail here in Atlantic City. Well, it's not Atlantic City, but it's the Atlantic County Jail. It's in Mays Landing. And she was on some charges. I'm not sure exactly what, but anyway, needless to say, she wanted a deal. Well, at the same time, my mom's cousin, Joelle, was in the county, and she had got one that Christine was trying to speak to the police in reference to my sister's case. So I guess that's when all hell broke loose. Christine ended up getting out of jail. The next when the detectives came and got me and questioned me and my sister and my dad was there. And then they interviewed, I guess, my aunt. So to this day, I believe that my aunt, my mom's twin sister, um, you know, told them where she believed Nina was because that was when they started digging all of a sudden. And when she came home or later on, she recanted. My mom and her twin sister has a relationship that I can't even describe. They've given birth under each other's name. They went to jail under each other's name. They've cashed checks. You name it, they've done it. So the relationship that they have is undescribable. So needless to say, I'm not surprised that my aunt recanted, and that's pretty much where we are today. They did move her case from a missing person's cold case to now it's declared pretty much a cold case homicide. I couldn't imagine how hard it was to sit down and to vocally go over everything that happened yet again. and. I thank you, Tamika, so much for taking the time to speak to me and help me with my research, and I hope that I can do something for this case, even if it is just keeping the memory of your sister alive in some way or spreading the word of her case because it deserves to be talked about, and her case is not talked about enough, and I hope that something can come of this and justice can eventually be served. It is so important when it comes to cases to hear everyone's story, and thank you, Tamika, for sharing your side of the story in today's video. Benita Karen Sanders' case is still an active and open case in today's time.
According to the Charlie Project, Benita Karen Sanders was an African American little girl standing at about two feet to two and a half feet tall and weighing about 30 pounds at most. She had black hair and brown eyes. Some physical characteristics of hers were that she had an abdominal hernia scar and a scar on the joint of her left wrist. One of her hands was deformed and curved inward. She was left-handed and her nickname was Nita. She was last seen wearing a short-sleeved yellow shirt with blue pants and blue and white sandals. If you have any information regarding the disappearance of Benita Karen Sanders, you are urged to call the Atlantic City Prosecutor's Office Major Crimes Unit at 609-645-7700. Remember that you can stay anonymous. Thank you, Tamika, again for helping me with my video, and thank you to everyone who spent a little bit of time out of their day to listen to this case, a case that has been heavy on my heart for the past week and a half since I started looking into it. If you yourself want to keep up with the case of Benita Karen Sanders, you can follow the Facebook page dedicated to the case that is run by her sister, Tamika. I will have that link down below in the description of this video. Just like with every single case that I cover here on my channel, leave your opinions about the case in the comments comments below this video and of course like always leave some love down there for the family members as well and with all that being said I will see you all in my next video bye guys